Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. My uh, teddy bear wanted to dress up today and show you something very special. You know, he always has his nice bow tie on, but he has something else on today, too. You see that? A cross. He has a cross on today because he wants you to know what the message of the cross is. He does have a cross on. That's right. Do you know what the message of the cross is? When you see the cross, what does that make you think of? Huh? What, do you, what does it make you think of? That Jesus died on the cross. Jesus dying there. Exactly. When we see the cross, we think of Jesus dying there. Now, why did he do that? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Go ahead. To take away our sins. To take away our sins. That's nice and loud. I'm glad you did that because we want other people to know that too, don't we? Jesus died on the cross to take away our sins. So if you look around church today, you see all kinds of crosses, don't you? There's crosses on the altar. There's a big cross back up there. There's a cross right there. There's another cross over there. And some people have crosses on their necklaces. And when we hear or see that cross, we remember that Jesus died on the cross. Now, is there anybody on this cross? There's nobody on this cross. That's because Jesus not only died to take our sins away, but he rose again. He rose again because he did everything perfectly. And now he gives that all to us. So when we wear a cross or when we see one, we remember the message of the cross that he died for us. He did rise again, that's right. And now he lives for us. Let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and doing everything perfectly in our place. Thank you for giving us credit for that, for taking our sins to the cross and leaving them there, for rising again, showing everything was done perfectly, and now preparing a place for us in heaven. Open our mouths to let others know about the message of the cross and how it can be for them as well. We pray these things in your name. Amen. God's Word appointed for this fourth Sunday of Lent is recorded for us in, the, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Our theme is going to be exactly what you and I just sang, Lift High the Cross of Christ. Listen to what the Bible says. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world though through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. This is God's word. We pray. Lord Jesus, sanctify us by your truth. Your inspired word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear followers of the cross, as I start out my sermon this morning, I have an important question to ask you. Ready? Are you smarter than a fifth grader? That's what producers of a past popular game show wanted to know. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Well, I played this game online. And after I played it, I found out a very cold, harsh reality. Apparently, I'm not smarter than a fifth grader in this game. But before you make any cheesy editorial comments, let me explain. This game is a lot harder than it looks. And like most people, and maybe like you, I like to think I know more than I actually do. Foolish, right? So I suppose you're wondering, which question got me? Okay, here's one. 
What color do you get if you mix the colors blue and red? I said green. The answer is purple. Kind of foolish, right? You might know that. Well, now it makes sense why I didn't get an A back in grade school art. I suppose it's a bit humbling to admit that in this game, I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. After all, we live in a world that prizes intelligence, academia, and 4.0s. But I suppose that was the way it was in the world that St. Paul lived. I mean, there were members of St. Paul's church that weren't impressed with him. They weren't impressed with his intelligence or his speaking ability. But then again, the Apostle Paul freely admitted that no one was going to be impressed by his brain power or his, his eloquence. But let me ask you, do you want a preacher that only can impress you with fancy theological terms like genus myostaticum or adiaphora in each paragraph of his sermon? I, I really doubt it. From what I read in scripture, God doesn't want a preacher just to try to impress you. Instead, the Apostle Paul tells us that his endgame wasn't out to show off, it was simply to show them the Savior by preaching Christ crucified for, for them. So Paul didn't mind it if some people called him simple. Preaching Christ crucified may not always be the most popular subject, nor, and it might seem foolish to others, but as we study the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's the only message of God that saves. Earlier in this sermon, we all sang it, lift high the cross. So as you walk away from church today and wonder what was the theme about, well, I pray you'll remember that we focus on Jesus here at St. Paul's and we lift high the cross. Many Greeks were critical of Christianity and the cross. They had no use for Jesus or the cross because they falsely believed that if they just studied the wisdom of the day or the current trends of the day and applied them to body and mind, they would, be, they would find happiness. The problem was they miscalculated greatly. They did not realize that how corrupt correct human nature is that we're born with and because of our sin what we do every day the bible describes our condition this way that we're dead in our trespasses and sins they thought there was enough good in people to overcome our condition that really makes this world a frustrating place to live sadly people in our day thought that the greeks were on to something in the book the secret the author, Rhonda Brine, said that if you just think good enough good thoughts, you can be happy here in this world. Well, that's like saying your car with poor alignment will be just fine if you just speak nice things to it. I mean, if you have a car that's out of alignment, you can speak everything you, all the nice things you want that's not going to change anything. No, the Bible says that if we try to ignore our sin here in this world, it's just going to make a mess. A mess in our lives here and eternally. Much like a mess is made if you left your dog with a chocolate bar for 10 minutes. Know what will happen? It sure won't be pretty. Believe me, I know. But instead of ignoring sin, the Apostle Paul tells us, lift high the cross and acknowledge it. Acknowledge what put Jesus on the cross and what made him suffer for your sins and for mine. Admit that we've done wrong? Oh, sure, the world says. Admit what you've done, but just don't take the blame. That's what hashtag sorry not sorry means. Oh, well, the reason I lied to my parents is because I was just trying to cover for a friend. The reason I didn't call my sister or care about her because, you know what, she doesn't really ask about me. The reason I skipped church was because, you know, I really had much better things to do. And frankly, 
I already know what the pastor is going to say. No, you're not to blame for your sin, so don't harbor any negative thoughts about yourself. Just think positive thoughts and you'll be just fine. That's the wisdom of this age that Satan wants you to believe. How foolish! Just like the man who ignores his bad car alignment is always going to lead to a crash, so too ignoring about what our sinful nature is like, well, and trying to think that, well, sin doesn't apply to me, is actually going to bring us into a spiritual wreck come Judgment Day. On Judgment Day, God says, all that has been done will be revealed. And more specifically, God will ask folks why they didn't believe that God himself has fixed our spiritual condition, our spiritual alignment of our souls. He has? This is most certainly true. That's why God sent Jesus into this world, not just to teach us to say nice or kind things, but to shoulder our sin. Jesus took all of your sin and mine, the sin that we did years ago, the sin that we did this morning, where Jesus paid for our sin fully with his blood. God didn't ignore our sins or try to sweep them under the carpet. Instead, God took out his holy anger on our sin by punishing Jesus in our place. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now our sin hasn't been minimized. Our sin has been neutralized. That's why we lift high the cross. The cross is like a scar from your last cancer surgery. You know that cancer that should have killed you was removed? The sin that should have damned us for all eternity was paid for in full. Jesus said, it is finished. Now I admit to you, the message of the cross, that must seem foolish to most people. The fact that some guy died for us 2,000 years ago still matters to us today? Well, that just seems foolish. And it seems too easy. It seems about as easy as an email that I got this past week. I got an email this past week that said, you want a Caribbean trip. But there's a catch. All you have to do is send your bank account and your password, and you're going to get that Caribbean trip. You know, a Caribbean trip this time of the year, the beach and the ocean, that sounds pretty good. But don't we need something else? Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in our reading. God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who will believe. Doesn't there need to be a catch to get to heaven? I mean, don't we need to earn it, deserve it? Or maybe there's a trivia contest. No, the Apostle Paul says, there is no catch. The message of the cross might seem foolish to some people. It might seem like there's a catch, but yet God says heaven is ours. Guaranteed, all because Christ was crucified on the cross for us. Salvation is ours right now. That is good news. Like the familiar favorite hymn, Rock of Ages says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I bring. And yet the world still mocks the message of the cross and the Christians who believe it. Well, you know that better than I do. You're on the front lines, even right here in the New Ulm community. Go to school, go to work with people who don't all believe it. And they might think it's funny that you believe the Bible. They might think it's funny that you find your salvation only through the cross. How can we ever convince them of the truth? Well, listen to what the Apostle Paul said. He said, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who believe. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's simple. Lift high the cross, because only there it's power. Think about it. You know, as Wells members, we clearly confess 
that there is power at the cross, that we believe that hearts and lives are only changed through the message of the cross. We confess that clearly, but do we believe it? Lift high the cross? I mean, sometimes we get to think, well, there's got to be something more. And so we want to analyze our programs. We want to take apart our worship services. We, want, we lament the fact that, well, our wells isn't growing as fast as it should. Well, maybe there's something wrong with the message that we have. Well, I'm not advocating ignoring all of that. In fact, it's a good idea to examine what we're doing, examine our ministries to make sure that we're giving God our best. It's important that we take a look at every worship service that we have to make sure that it's Christ-centered and that we're not going through the motions. But let's not change the message that got us where we are today. Let's not minimize the cross or marginalize it. Instead, let's focus on it. Let's focus on the clear message that Christ died for us. That's the message that matters. That's what makes the difference between heaven and hell, between life and death. How important it is that you and I hear that message of the cross every single week. You might think it's funny that I didn't know that red and blue make purple. You maybe knew that right away, probably pretty obvious to you. And it is pretty humbling to admit that in this game, I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. Actually, I've been told that there have only been two winners of this game show ever. My friends, it's not about what you know as a Christian. It's about who you know as a Christian. You see, God tells us that you and I are smarter, smarter than a fifth grader, smarter than a Harvard graduate who's an atheist. If you know that Jesus died for your sins, and that message means everything. Because it's important that we lift high the cross. It's important that we have crosses at home, that we wear crosses. Those crosses aren't just decorations, they're proclamations to the world about what has saved us. But rather than prizing just our Christian intelligence, may we be smart enough to share it with somebody we know somebody that's close to us, our friends and family, who are literally dying without that message. Amen. For our stewardship thought today, I pray that you remember the word urgency. Urgency. Have you been watching March Madness, the basketball tournament? Maybe you've been watching basketball, or maybe you appreciate another sport, and maybe your team is behind. Maybe they're just kind of walking the ball up when they're behind by a few points. And haven't you just found yourself looking at the screen and saying, move it, get going, there isn't much time. Well, as Jesus approached the end of his ministry, we know that Jesus told his disciples up front that what exactly what was going to happen, that he was going to go to the cross for them. And yet the disciples didn't always have so much urgency to be able to serve him. And so Jesus told them that Judgment Day is closer than they think. He told them about the signs of the times, but he shared that for us too. Here's my point. God has blessed us with so many things, our time, our talents, and treasures. How important is it for us to serve God today with urgency? The end of our lives, the end of the world is coming closer than we think. God has made you and me blessed people. That's not intended to make you scared. It's intended to motivate you to be motivated by Jesus' love, to use those gifts to serve God and to give God our best generously today. We pray the third verse of the hymn, number 565, There Still Is Room. We pray, Now is the time, how fast the moments fly, how soon each day is gone. You virgins hear, and heed the midnight cry. Look for the break of dawn. The bridegroom comes, prepare to meet him. Rise, trim your lamps, go out and meet him. Now is the time, now is the time. Amen. <laughs>